So here we are talking about Return to Hardwick, a fantastic new documentary about the 93rd Bomb Group. I'm here with the filmmaker, producer, and director, Michael Sellers, and the narrator, Michael Cudlitz. Michael, tell us where you began with this journey. How, why the 93rd and where did it all begin? Well, first of all, thank you for having uh, myself and, and Michael Cudlitz on. We appreciate the attention on the film. It's uh, well-deserved. Uh, representing the families of the 93rd Bomb Group and also the veterans. Uh, yeah, my grandfather was in the 93rd Bomb Group. Uh, he, I'm going to think, yeah, 1944. It was kind of like July to November was his time there, and he was the bombardier navigator. Um, you know, fast forward, I kind of heard about reunions that he would go to with my grandmother. Uh, we get to 2001, and he invites me to one. Uh, is it when I think it was England... Norwich, 2001, sometime in the winter time. And I was amazed, to be honest with you, what actually went on. That I think we had about 1,700 people from the second air division, which the 93rd was a part of. And I, we went through days of traveling to Hardwick. We went to the dedication of the, the library in Norwich, which was at that time because the old one had burnt down. Uh, so, so really informative. And I was hooked basically just to sum it all up at that point. And any of the local reunions that uh, they would have, I would go to with my grandfather. Uh, my grandfather has since passed, but I am now an officer in the group and I still attend reunions every year. And it's taken some time to get this to the screen. And, and, and Michael Kudlitz, how did you get involved? Because I remember seeing your name in attached to this maybe even a couple of years ago. So, so how did you get involved? Um, I actually got involved through uh, a mutual friend, uh, both uh, Michael and myself. Um, uh, the godfather of my kids, uh, Perry Anzalotti, is another actor, and he uh, used to work for Nabisco. And the ad company that, uh, that uh, did all the advertising for this campaign uh, was kind of an offshoot of Nabisco and a uh, friend of Michael's or maybe relative. I, was it a friend or relative of yours, Michael? It was a, it was a friend through Jim Root, yeah. who's the president of the 93rd. Okay. And a friend, uh, if they knew, they were looking, you know, they weren't really sure what they were looking for, to be honest. Uh, they were looking for someone to help them out early on. So I think even back then, it was still, Michael was still figuring out what it was going to be fully, but I think he had gotten to the point where he realized, all right, it's going to, it's going to be some sort of, there's going to be some sort of narration element. And uh, I think initially Michael asked me, he says, we're going to, you know, just do this little sort of uh, wrap around um, to introduce the film. And then we're going to mostly be using found footage and the voices of the families and um, the veterans and, those in the organization and those who are keeping the, you know, as you see in the documentary, those who are keeping the sites still alive. So it's going to really be told really through their voices, um, which majority of the film is. But they reached out and said, hey, do you, you know, you have any interest in helping out? Uh, I got a buddy who's, you know, he's connected with a, a veterans group. Uh, they do these reunions and they're doing this documentary. And I was like, yep, I'm in. And they're like, well, I mean, do you know, care what it's really about? I really don't. I, I said not to be a jerk, but I, I, I understand yeah. what, what this is. Uh, um, so I, I don't have to, it doesn't matter how I feel about it. It's like, this is important. Um, it needs to be done. And uh, if I can help lend credibility to it and get some more eyes on it to see these stories, uh, just by being part of it, um, then I will, I'm more than happy to, to donate my services and, you know, be, be a part of it in any way I can. And then, Michael will tell you as, as we went on, it evolved and he found there was a bigger story, obviously, that the little story lived inside. Uh, and to tell the broad strokes of the bigger story, we, you know, we wound up narrating those, those pieces through myself and then there's some other uh, actors and uh, some other uh, members of the group that talk and, and, and guide us through, uh, you know, the story. So I came to it not knowing anybody and honestly just uh, doing a favor for someone who I felt was doing something important. I think the the fact it was a very collaborative and heartfelt, I think comes across very well because it, I like the fact it covers the American point of view and being British. Um, I like the fact it was about the local communities as well. And it, 
it wasn't full of historians doing the usual talking heads. That's what you know, I, I do some of that work. And sometimes it ends up just being people sitting in offices talking about something that they're, they're knowledgeable about, but they're detached from. And yes. I like the fact that everyone involved in this, you could see from the family members to the, the people in England and the, the veterans, it was a passion for them. It was their life. It was their, their hobby, their passion. That all came through very well. Honor. Yeah, the, the, thing, the thing is, is that Michael, again, is being very humble. He, uh, for him to step up and to be able to be a part of this was really big for us. You have to understand, we're just a normal veterans organization. I mean, I'm there to support the veterans and the family members and also support something that my grandfather was a part of. Uh, and it was the idea of, you know, getting somebody involved with somewhat of a name and, and being able to push this out even a little further. So, so to do that and to have Michael come on and not really ask any questions, you know, I mean, to just step on and be able to go, yeah, sure. What do you need? Uh, he even did the on-camera introduction at the end, at the top of the film. I mean, that's huge. I was like, oh, wait, he wants to come out too and not just voice the film, but actually be in the film. So that, that meant a lot to us. Well, and it comes across. I mean, you can tell by the, the way Mike talks, there's a passion behind it. And I mean, I, I said at the beginning, I, I loved it. I loved the cinematography. I loved the fact you combined the American and the British stories and everybody involved was clearly 100% committed to it. And that yeah. all comes across. And, uh, and I like the fact that you didn't go into the, the politics of, of daylight bombing and all that aspect of things that is such a hot potato these days. It's just right. irrelevant. These men did their jobs. I lost a great uncle in the, with Bomber Command over Germany. So oh, wow. I've heard all the, all the stuff about Arthur Bomber Harris and Doolittle and should we been doing it? It's irrelevant. These guys were enlisted or conscripted right. and they went off and did a job and you got sent somewhere. And, you know, so I really liked it. And I have to say, from, for you as, a, as the producer and director, Going from New York to, to rural Norfolk, that must have been for your first trip there, something of a culture yeah. shock. I live 50 miles south and I feel out of water when I go to that part of Norfolk. So <laughs> yeah. I'm just like for a New Yorker going there. It's, um, it's well, a special place, Norfolk. Yeah, the only thing I could relate it to is that my parents and practically my mother's whole side lives in Missouri. And, uh, you know, it's, it's country over there. So, I mean, I get a little taste of that during the summers and and during, uh, say, Christmas time and, and visiting with them, yes, I do come back to the hustle and bustle of New York City, but, but that's what it kind of equaled to me. And I was, you know, they're very welcoming there, of course, and it, it just, you, you take a big breath when you're there, you get to see the landscape and you take in uh, the weather. And I mean, especially to be there during the spring and summer, it's really, really nice there. And how, I can't beat it to be able to be on part of the airbase that was, you know, the original airbase from the war. So learning something every time I'm there. I mean, what was unique for the British people who had American air bases near them is they got to see American servicemen not only before they saw combat, but while they were doing, doing combat. A unit like the 101st Airborne or the 82nd that came for England, right. they were there when they were training. But then they off they go overseas. The villagers and the civilians never got to see that fatigue and the PTSD but with the air crews of course they're, li they're living in the community so I think you managed to capture very neatly in the film that the bond between the locals and the, and the oh, yeah. and purely and that came across mm -hmm. and I, I love that bit a lot and the, you know, how sad all they were about the aircraft that crashed at the end of the runway and the little monument that yeah. was there and how it's just amazing to see the, the American servicemen and their and their descendants having such a connection with the descendants of the locals now, because everyone who was there at the time has, has pretty much passed on now. So your your, right. your film will be a long term tribute to what they did, and I, I I can only thank you very much for bringing it to a wider audience. It's an amazing story. No, of course, yeah, thank you. I mean, the idea really what what I think drew me in, uh, say you know back in two thousand one when I first visited, is the museum. And that, as you probably know, a lot of the air bases, the full air base isn't there. Uh, you know, housing areas are being built on them. Farmland has returned, all that kind of stuff. But to be able to market in some way, and these are existing huts, buildings that are left. That's what, the, that's what Hardwick is doing. Uh, there are landowners that allow this stuff to still be there. Um, and they keep them up every year. Uh, in fact, I just saw some video today on Facebook where they're mowing the lawn around the huts and getting them ready and deciding when to open. Of course, 
in today's world where they need to be a little careful of when that happens, but they've got to paint the exteriors of the huts and make sure they're ready for summer. So that really draws everybody in, I think. And then the surrounding area with the memorial sites, uh, it's really neat to be able to see all the other air bases doing that in some way. I mean, you can go to Thorpe's Abbott where the hundredth uh, bomb group was. And I mean, their hut is huge. They've, they've got a lot of original stuff there, including the tower, which is amazing to walk through. I mean, they restored that. It's a, it's a full on museum. That is what draws people. And it draws people like me from the States to be able to go over there. So you kind of just have to turn your camera where you need it and, and watch the people just react to a place like that. No, definitely. It's that those places like like I live in Normandy, history is just I walk outside, there's history. And for the Eighth Air Force and uh, and how how much they meant to the people of East Anglia, uh, those long term right. friendships. And uh, and for you as the narrator, Michael, um, you obviously when you made Band of Brothers, you got to meet 101st Airborne veterans and the likes of Bill Garnier and Babe Heffron. Have you spoken to Eighth Air Force veterans? Because they're very different, aren't they? Their experiences were so, so remote because you're in intense combat one minute and then you're going to a, a dance in an English village. Then you're going back to combat two days later. Are they different to the, to the airborne veterans you've met? Uh, oddly, no. Um, no, I mean, yeah, I think they had in some ways different, uh, different base experiences, but a lot of those experiences are shared because up until training, you know, they, they all, you know, trained in a similar way, trained on different types of equipment, but trained in the same, you know, size groups. Now the guy, the bomb groups from my understanding and everything, this is like Band of Brothers. Everything I know about Band of Brothers is through studying for Band of Brothers. So it has a very, very uh, 101st centric uh, push to it. But everything I know about the 93rd is through this film uh, and through speaking with people after and the talks after. Um, but the common thing that I that I see is that, you know, there's this one time where, where there's a couple, couple of times when the men are talking about it, but they're not specifically talking about it. And, you, and you'll know what I mean when I get there. Um, there's one specific time, uh, I forget who it is, but the, the veteran is actually talking about, you know, those those men in the ship with you, you know, in the bomb, in the bomb, the bomber, those ten guys. You like you went out with them, and you came back with them, you know. So it was is a little different situation than the guys, you know, 101st, where you would lose one one guy here or there it's you know the, the typical thing was i mean every once in a while a guy would would get killed a gun a, you know a gunner or somebody in a per particular portion of the aircraft would take shrapnel um but generally generally speaking you either all came back or nobody came back mm. is is the the kind of the gist that i got um from doing this and that it, it was uh you you absolutely were putting your lives in the hands of the men next to you and or the boys next to you at that time you know because they were they were all very young men so they talk about that camaraderie you know in there and the connection bet between those groups and then they also someone else is talking about oh yeah we got woken up but it wasn't us we weren't going the other group went and then you realize x number of whatever two hours later the crash and you're like oh yeah. That could have been us, but it wasn't us. But there's still that survivor's guilt that it wasn't us, but thank God it wasn't us because mm. me and my nine other buddies are, are okay. So that sense of really looking out to the guy to the left and to the right of you and, and putting everything you have in, in their hands so far as literally your life, um, that, that, that element is universal, I think, to any soldier. Uh, and that, that's the one thing that I am, you know, uh, hearing over and over again, whether it be you know an American soldier or a British soldier or German soldiers or and, like the, the 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 camaraderie um, of soldiers um, is universal. Uh, I think yeah. is what we're seeing. You know, mm -hmm. there's this mindset. You know that like you can talk about the politics all day long, but the men and women who are doing all the things they're not they're not it's not a political thing. They're following orders. Uh, and if the case is, you know, uh, if the case is perfect, like it was in World War II, and I mean perfect in the sense of like evil, kill. Let's, we got an evil thing that we got to go stop. 
that's when the, you know, when it's really cut and dry as to what we're doing and what we're doing it for. So even at the time that you get a sense that all the soldiers wanted to be there, they they were all there. They wanted to be there. Whereas now there's a little bit of different things going on. Now everything is so highly politically charged. Everybody has an opinion. Uh, it's not a bad thing. I'm just saying that it's, it's, but everything, everybody has an opinion of what's going on. So there are people I believe now that are probably going into war that don't believe in the cause they're fighting for, but they are still fighting for their government. They're still ultimately putting, you know, their, their trust and their lives in the men and the women to the left and right of them. And that's the thing that keeps coming back to the surface is that we're in this together with each other in the immediate. And that's, that's universal. Well, I think a yes. perfect example of that is the fact that, you know, Jimmy Stewart was a bomber, a bomber pilot in the 8th Air Force. You know, he literally walks out of Hollywood to, to, yeah. to, to take part in combat over the war-torn skies of Europe. And, uh, and you, you had in the 8th Air Force senators' sons, and, um, and maybe without going down today's, you don't quite have that same connection with the war affecting everybody. Back then, the war affected yeah. everybody. The villagers yeah. in England were affected by it, and those air crews. And you know, the difference again for for me as a as a fan of the uh, of a fan is a strange word, but a fan of what the Eighth Air Force and the, the Bomber Command did is you can't possibly hide or shirk your responsibility in an air crew flying at forty thousand feet over occupied Europe. If you're a combat soldier, you can theoretically, go and dive in a ditch and get out, get out of it for half an hour. You can't get out of it if you're flying over. In, in a, you're a part of a team, and you're part of the team with a, a mechanical beast as well. I mean, the B-24 Liberator is, was a couple of years old when these guys are getting in it as a weapon of war. It's pushing technology. And these guys, average age of 21, are boarding this aircraft and flying it higher than human beings have been flying up to about two years previously. And your film captures, I think, the, the rawness of what that experience was. And, and you can just suddenly, a whole crew, bang, you, know, you, you, you don't make it off the end of the runway. Or, right. or you, you have engine failure before you even get across the channel. That, to me, is, is fascinating. And uh, anything that reminds us today of how awful it was for that generation, I think, could only be a good thing. And, you, and your film does that without preaching. And yeah. looking at bomb crews, the two of you, You've got to be in a bomb crew. Which position, which role would you take? Air gunner, pilot? <laughs> Let's say, I, I, you know, it's more of out of an interest, but uh, I don't know if I would want to do what my grandfather did. He was the bombardier. He would have to be able to operate the Norton bomb site. And eventually, I, I don't know how many times he flew lead plane, but uh, he would need to be proficient on the bomb site and to know where these bombs are going to drop. I, I would be more interested in the radio, I think, uh, station. I think that would be interesting to me. That's a whole other world, too, to be able to learn all that and to be able to keep up communication. So I think that would be my choice. I think I would want to be the pilot uh, only because there's uh, the perceived lie that you tell yourself that you're actually in charge. Mm. Yeah, <laughs> and then you're in control of what's happening because I feel like right. the it's, it's a complete antithesis to say I want to be a tail gunner. You're like, what? like you are just sitting there hanging down. <laughs> it's like you are not in control. You are dealing with what is coming at you and and where the the pilot is putting you. But even that, the pilot is you know trying to avoid getting shot down and still try to get to you know point Z. Um, you want to be in a little control, just a little. Yeah, exactly. Or, or the perceived, you know, the idea of, oh, I see it coming and I can do something to maybe. Yeah. When the, when yeah. the, when the truth of the matter is that they didn't see it coming. Like the oh, stuff, the, the one that you, the one that hits you, you don't see coming. Um, so, but yeah, I don't, I don't, I think it would be, uh, I think it would be terrifying. <laughs> it um, definitely would be. I just think the whole thing would be terrifying. The noise, the, the smell, you know, but between the fuel and the, the, the rounds, you know, the, oh it just, you know, the whole thing would be completely full of smoke either way. Even if you were doing well, it was a shitty situation. Um, and to do it at that age, you know, and I love my kids dearly. They're, they're 23. Um, you know, they got trouble getting out of bed. Um, <laughs> you know, these guys were, you know, 20 and flying these, these fortresses. Uh, I, I, it's amazing. And Michael, to you, when you're putting this film together, 
where, where do you find the balance between going into too much, if you like, geeky historical detail, but keeping the story going? I mean, personally, I think you've got the balance exactly right. But was that a tough call to get that right? Yeah. Uh, yeah, it was. Um, the, the thing was, is that one of the first mandates, which it was, was even before we were going to do the trip to Hardwick and maybe capture second and third generation members going back to the airbase, was that the veterans uh, wanted to tell the history of the 93rd. It's a theme. If you go to these reunions, it's a constant theme of, well, let's talk about what we did. Of course, that's what you do at a reunion about a 93rd bomb group. You go there and talk about yourself and what they did. And family members get to know about what happened. And so that's that's like number one, is that we need our history in here. And the whole point is is for future generations to be able to come back and look at that history and and have a place to go for it. And that was primary. Okay, easy enough. You can you can open the books, do some research, make sure you get the dates right the years right, the missions right, the campaigns and all that stuff. But I I didn't want this to end up being just a DVD that we handed out to people at the reunion. I wanted it to be a little more than that. And that's a little bit of my background, background training, going to film school and just being a part of short films that I've been a part of and some narrative long feature films. But this is the first one where maybe I'm going to be actually jumping on. And I thought the idea to make it a little more personal would be a bonus. But the trick is, and as you asked, how do you mix that in to where it works? Because you could blast a bunch of history up there and you could blast a bunch of stuff about personal trip and you know, my grandfather was in the war, but how do you connect all that so it kind of comes back into each other? Uh, it was a big puzzle, I have to tell you. And I remember a friend of mine, Nick Coleman, who lives in East Anglia and helped uh actually he lives yeah near norwich he helped a lot with the drone shots that we did and i was back on my second year of getting drone shots it took over three years to basically get a lot of those drone shots and he looked at me on the second year and he's like you got yourself into a pickle because what he knew what he knew about was i'm telling this history and some of the stuff that he's seen but i'm coming back and trying to link this personal story together so uh in the edit there were days where you just have to kind of stand up and walk away. <laughs> you got to come back to it and say, well, I know I've got this. Let me see if I can link this. I think the hardest one was doing the Ploesti mission and then understanding how we're going to come back and see them back on their trip. Uh, and I found in the research, I found in Ted's Traveling Circus, which is a book about the 93rd, a great little excerpt that sort of summed up how they felt when they were gonna come back home from Africa. So, well, we've got Americans coming back to the base and they're gonna be on the base. So linking those sort of transitions was very important for the film. And maybe that's a little bit of what you're talking about, about that balance, but it took a while to, to get there. And especially when you're wearing all the hats, you're producing, writing, directing. Yeah. It's hard to, you can't criticize yourself in the different roles. You have to sort of somehow be objective about it. And, you, and, and yet you can't have had these many, many people giving you too much input because it, you, it's, yeah. a, it's a, not a solo project. I mean, if you're sure you had that, hundreds of very willing people, but you're, when it's all your own project, it's, it can be tough. Um, it is, yeah. And, and my wife... Uh, was pretty tired by the end of, okay, I would come home at night and play a little something because I had uploaded it on Vimeo so she could watch it online on our TV. I said, you just got to watch this scene for a minute, watch this scene for a minute. And then she's an editor also here in New York. So I knew I had somebody in capable hands of watching it and give me some criticism. Some of the key scenes uh, is due to her as far as too long, make it short, don't really care about that. You know, you need those people throughout this process to basically come in and say that. And I know Michael can probably relate to that on a lot of projects as well. But you you need that outside because you will go crazy. You will literally yeah, go crazy. You need, after a uh, while. you need the no. Yeah. You know, you need somebody to go, no. You know, that's mm -hmm. that in our school we used to it was called, I think, uh in the potting. Throwing pots and Zen uh, and the art of motorcycle yeah. maintenance. So it's like kill your babies. Yes, you know, it's yeah. like this thing of like you're in love with it, but that's great. You know what? It's not serving the whole. 
And yeah, it's really amazing when it exists in its own little space. But yeah, that's great. When you cut yeah, that out and save it and watch it every once in a while because it's not going in the movie. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Give me a bonus extras or something. But if I can, I'll give you a quick example. And I don't think I'll be giving too much too much away here. But the end of the film, uh, we actually do have Gail uh, go back to the chapel where her parents were married. Now um, that. That is an interesting scene because that was actually shot about three years later. Um, that was not shot on that trip. The problem with Gail is that I didn't have a third act. I had no way to end her story. But the idea, I knew that chapel was there. They actually had previous owners when we took the trip in 2015. But fast forward, and I said, oh, new owners are there. And I had some people there um, in Topcroft, the town that's close to the base, that knew of the new owners. And I said, well, if you can, let me try to get in touch with them because Gail's parents got married in there along with other service people on the base. They got married in that chapel. But I think, I think it would be nice to get Gail back in there uh, and walk through it and possibly you know, be there where her parents were married. So that is something that a scene that turned out to be, I mean, here I go back, a special trip. I get some extra footage of the base and I'm going to be there for that day to shoot this scene. I edited that scene and it turned out to be like six minutes long, six or seven minutes long. And I showed my wife and she's like, why is this so long? Like, cause I had a lot of the owners of the church of the chapel in there and their story and what they felt. And she's like, you know, nothing against those people. <laughs> but at this point in the movie, I don't really care about those people. Yes, I care about them that they're the owners of the chapel and very cool that they let Gail in, but that's not the story. The story Mm. is Gail and I need to shift that attention back to Gail. So as you see now in the film, it's a couple shots of them in the interview and it's all Gail going through this process. So it just like, you know, that's another thing of killing your babies. That's, I had to do that. Even though I loved those people for letting me in, I had to kind of shorten it down. But well, the thing is, your, an audience wouldn't sit and watch a four-hour documentary. They would just get yeah. bored halfway through. So, you you know, that's yeah. with, when you're writing history or showing history, you've got to know where to leave the stories for a pub conversation later as opposed right. to giving them to your audience. And, uh, and, that's and it. Uh, keep coming back. You did an incredible job. And So what is the, what's the one takeaway you would want people watching this to, to have? You know, and I don't mean the history buffs particularly, but I mean the, the people who know nothing about World War II who are watching it almost by accident. Well, if I could twist that just a little bit, you know, it's great that we got distribution for the film. It's great that it'll be on June 9th available pretty widely here in the U.S. and Canada. That, for me, and for some of the people that were involved in the film uh, behind the scenes, is great. Um, That's really awesome. But I want to direct that towards schools. And I want to direct it towards uh, libraries and people that will be able to pick this film up possibly for free to be able to watch 73 minutes and get a little bit of what the war was about. I tell it from the angle of the air war. And obviously, uh, Michael was involved with the 101st or Band of Brothers and people on the ground. But this is the air war. But I try to tell the story of World War II in its simplest form. Yes, we could go deeper. Yes, we could talk about more campaigns. But to understand what got us in there, what was a midpoint, and how it sort of ended, I think is super important. Even if I have text at the end talking about the Holocaust, at least you get the full scope of what's going on. And I think students at schools, um, people that do frequent their you know, home, the libraries in their local town, could pick this up and watch that. Uh, is super important because we cannot let that go. We have to remember what happened back then. And if that's something that they could take away from this, along with the personal stories that I do tell in the film, it's great. But get the idea of what the war was and get the message from that that we we just can't let it happen again. Well, you you are wise to have some of the grandkids and things involved as well because there can be World War II documentaries where it's all just people in their 90s talking. And as interesting as that is, 
people under 40 don't connect with that necessarily. I do. I love meeting World War II veterans. But right. you know, to have to show the family members going to the Cambridge Cemetery and things like that, I think was incredibly important that it, it, it doesn't have to just be a subject that dad and granddad are interested in. It can be a subject that we're all interested in because... You know, I often right. say to people in Normandy, you know, when people say, I'm not interested in history, I say, well, you are in, interested in history because you're interested in being able to vote. You're interested in being able to marry who you choose to marry. All of, all of those things we have acquired, all those rights, all those things we take for granted are because of the people who fought in history to give us those yes. rights. And World War II is a fundamental part of where we are today. And trying to connect it to, to, um, to what a, a young person is going through is, is tricky. And, and, but... but Anything that helps, and your film certainly does, just get across what these young men did. And and, the, and talking about the daughters and the family members and the kids, that, that the little boy, who was, who was obviously an elderly when you interview, who watched the aircraft go off and counted them all coming in and coming off. Right. That, to me, is that resonates with my family's experience of seeing young men going off to war sure. and, and them all not coming back. So... Um, you know, I sound like an, a, a, a gushing fangirl, but I, I thought it was a really good yeah. documentary. You know, it's, I'm, I'm glad this being able to interview yeah, fell in my lap because I yeah. thoroughly enjoyed watching it. I've watched it three times now, and um, oh, wow. each Thank time you. I see something different in it. So, yeah. um, Thank you very much. Same thing. I, I, I was actually taken, uh, for me, I love how nothing is sensationalized in it. It really is... Um, it's almost like the cold news, but it's loaded with all of these facts and all of these, ultimately, all of these emotions uh, because the subject matter is so emotionally charged. Um, but it's not about, uh, you know, it, it, none of these things. Band of Brothers was the same thing with this. It's not like none of these men and women individually are have some sort of superhero or like incredible heroic story you know what the heroic story is is that a lot of them fucking came home mm, yeah. and when you get the pieces of you hear and you see and smell and feel and the smoke and the, and everything that they, and everything that was against them just to even survive it you know because michael lays out pretty you know pretty bleakly like you look at ploesti i mean that was what a what a shit show that was yes you know i mean mm. that's not there's no like and, and there and you know, that was like bridge too far. You know, it's like, it's, it's like what, like the intention, sure, on paper. And then we have, you know, things like Normandy that on paper, this could work. You know, I think that was the thing that they went into. It's like, I, I, I think this could work. It wasn't like, yeah, yeah. it was sort of like, right. I think this is how we do it. There was no, nobody had done this before. So it, it was a success. So it's, it's celebrated as such. There were a lot of these other missions, you know, uh, that did test the you know the 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 experience of the men and women the, the equipment the ability the egos that were running everything uh and some of these things had some not so great consequences like many of them had not so great consequences and were effective in a small way there was some damage done to ploesti and you know they did have to recover from that but when you relook really at it it's just like wow one one thing goes wrong in a chain reaction, especially when they're avoiding flak and they're going through and everything's chaos. Like we were talking earlier, it's like just the idea is really just to sort of just, Oh my God, just can we just get through it and land? And then to still in the middle of that, be able to, to do some semblance of a mission and realize, all right, we went wrong. And then oh, we're, we're cutting back over. And then all the, you can imagine all the radio chatter with the guys who were going in, taking incoming, talking to their, all their, guys in their group and then another group is coming back at them and they, i assume that they were talking on the radio saying no it's us we're coming back and they're sort of like what the hell are you talking about you're coming back and just this whole i, I just think he, he he just paints that picture of that chaos and and it is that that battlefield that is so clearly delineated mm. and drawn but in the sky yeah. and you know you realize that the success of that mission was that that those that got home, that was the success of that. Yeah. that. And, and they actually lost a lot. But the idea that we didn't lose everybody and we actually were able to take care of some of the mission, you know, and the men are still, as they should be, very proud that they did that and that they got home. But they all know, it's like, yeah, that, of, yeah. of all the bad days, that was one of the worst, probably. Well, I, lo I love that aspect of the film, particularly because uh, over the years, in my reading of it, I hate... I hate a strong word. I don't like the reference to those attacks as being a thousand bomber raid. I prefer a 10,000 plus people raid. 
It's not the aircraft that we care about. They're yeah. being produced yeah. on the production lines. We don't care about aircraft. There's, there's loads of them. It's people. So why, why do we measure it by the number of bombers that went? Why is it not the 10,000 plus people yeah. raid? And your, your right. film got across the losses on the Plasty raid. And it, it's yeah. not about aircraft. It's, it, it, uh, that has frustrated me for years, a thousand bomber raid. The bombers didn't go on their own. <laughs> They're crewed yeah. by yeah. thousands of men. And that, that, though you didn't say those exact words, but what I got from that was it was young men doing something that really they hadn't, they'd been kind of yeah. half trained for, half prepared for. It, the, the shit hit the fan, things didn't work properly, but it was part of an overall learning curve. And, and it was just about, hu- it was human loss is, is the, right. the thing that come, comes across so well in your film. Yeah, that's, you know, I have to thank some of the people that I go to the reunions uh, for because it's sort of instilled in me to to paint it that way because it's right in my face every time of of the numbers and, and you know, in the, in the books that we do read on the group. Um, so, so, and it's very prominent in the film because I, I post it up as these big, bold numbers that come up. So uh, I did have a friend early on last year when, I was getting close to locking the film and he, you know, out of everything, he went back all the way to that mission and pointed out that I put those numbers up there big and bold and it, it stuck with him all the way to the end of the film. There's a lot of things going on in film. That's the first thing he said. So that, I guess that says a lot and it does, it makes your brain sort of calculate not the planes, but the people that were in those planes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we can't take on board the scale of things in terms of you know, D-Day that I talk about for a living is too vast for us as mere humans to take on board. We can't visualize 7,000 ships. We can't visualize yeah. 11,000 aircraft, but we can visualize, like with what my, Michael did with Band of Brothers, a, a few dozen men who know each other watching each other die. And that resonates and it connects with us. And it's why right. human interest stories about the war will always... Um, do more to to get across that that mission than than big documents about how many aircraft were made. And there's yeah. you know, we all know the historical geeks will say that oh yes, well of course that was the B twenty four G model that did that, not the not the. Yeah. Who cares? Yeah. The rivet counters <laughs> care about that stuff. Um, yeah. it, what matters yeah. is that every time an aircraft doesn't come back, some some adjutant at a squadron has to write ten plus letters back. Yeah. Your parents and grandparents and That's wives cool. and 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 go and take all those num the names off the blackboard and the mission that that and that is that's that's the real factor and yeah. again, well that's I'm also uh, it. it's also uh, there's a pro I think for for all governments there's a propaganda machine that that kicks in to some degree um, what, depending upon how transparent your government can be but to say something like uh, Patton's Third Army swept through and, you know, you're like, whoa, well, mm-hmm. how many men? How many boys? You know? Right. Oh, they swept through and they only got 10% lost. They were great. Wait, back up? What, what exactly happened? You know, and, and it's easy to talk about things from a non-emotional standpoint if you say, you know, well, the 93rd, but if you say Tom right. and his mm. nine buddies... Yeah. Woke up six o'clock in the morning, you know, and they knew that they had a fuel, you know, a fuel load that was bigger than anything that they ever had before. They were actually starting to, you know, uh, retrofit with uh, exterior fuel uh, containers inside and dropping out some of the bombs to compensate for the weight. And you sort of go, oh, shit, I, I guess I guess we're going really far today, you know, <laughs> and the guys yeah. trying to figure out the missions as they're going because they weren't given information. You know, it's like they knew how far they were going based on how much fuel was in the plane. Mm. You know, it's, it's insane. But we talk about it historically and it's just like, oh, England came here and, you know, oh, they had to go get all the guys across the channel. So they got a whole bunch of, you know, boats and they got them over. You know, and then you talk to you got Dunkirk and then you see, wait, what, wait, what? You know, it's like we mm. the, put faces to it, put the individual experiences to it, and then people connect to it and can identify. Otherwise, it's just uh, it's just history, like I learned it when I was a kid, which is dates, and mm. and history is not dates. History is people. Yeah, absolutely. So we'll bring it to end fairly soon. But what would be if you could do another World War Two project, either uh, as a team or individually? What would be the one story? that you would absolutely love to bring to an audience about 
the Second World War, or indeed any war, but what's the one? I'll, I'll, cut, I'll cut in real quick because I, I don't want him to... I know what Michael's <laughs> next story is, and I, yeah. and I think it's fantastic, but we're not going to talk about that. Okay. So we're going to talk about his second most favorite thing to bring, because I think his first is is going to happen, and if we put it out there, somebody might grab part of it. Yeah. So tell him your, <laughs> tell him your second favorite thing you want to do. Yeah, I can't say my first. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. You know, to be honest with you, the second favorite thing would be Michael. I mean, unless I you disagree, about, if you disagree and you think you can put that out there, you could drop us a little, a little, a little, little hint. Little. Well, uh, let's say let's go to the second thing. The, the second thing is I actually talked to Michael about a series of him uh, going around to uh, establishments or places in the states or you know international and to to document how people are remembering the past specifically it doesn't have to be specifically world war ii but specifically war were related mm -hmm. and i think michael sort of represents that in some of his work uh and uh, you know that that is something that's been pitched to michael is it happening right now no because i can't even step outside my door <laughs> but but down the line possibly you know it, it could be and uh, reconnect with some of the locations that I've talked to and, and maybe try to get it going later on. Number one would be the Ploesi mission, uh, to be able to make that into a narrative feature or a documentary of some sort or a hybrid. Uh, mm. But to discuss the 79 people that were interned in Romania uh, is a fascinating story. Um, I mean, it deals with a lot of different sections of people uh, in Romania. It deals with the Germans, uh, you know, basically taking over that oil field for, for all their um, reasons for their machines, uh, and the U.S. attempting obviously to destroy it. They actually thought that they were going to destroy that the first time and be done and solved. Not true. They had to go back hundreds and hundreds of more times to try to get rid of that oil field. Uh, but it would be about that initial mission uh, and and what the 79 people went through uh, as a POW. Uh, and how they got out because it was another rescue mission to actually get them out. Oh wow! Yeah, that's a, that's a good story. I, I I remember reading about a guy, in a different bomb group who got interned by the Swiss in World War Two, and because mm -hmm. Swiss was new, neutral, they didn't quite know what to do with them. They didn't treat him as a prisoner of war. Yeah. So they put him in with all the murderers. Yeah, the ordinary Swiss murderers and rapists. And this poor guy spent a year and a half. Wow. And, it's, it, and, and he called it the black hole of um, some, some Swiss name. And it was just oh harrowing reading this, this guy completely abandoned. It was just one guy. So there was no embassies calling up. It wasn't big enough for any general officer to start going. Getting, getting one Crazy stuff. I mean, they're, they're, wow. but yeah, Romania is another hot potato to discuss. But uh, it's... Um, it is. Would be fantastic to see. I mean, anything. I mean, it's, the timing is right now with your documentary, with the whole Masters of the Air thing, that the Apple production that's in. You know, that there's going to be a lot of interest right. in, um, in flying. I, I think we've yeah we have maybe timed it out well for at least to sit on the platforms and be there for a resource mm. for people. I think it's been such an effort for us uh, as again we're not a movie studio. Uh, I'm a you know independent freelancer here in New York, and I work in production and TV and film. And the group is a veterans organization, like I said before. We're not a movie studio. They raised all this money by themselves. There was no, you know, rich uncle that owns Warner Brothers that, you know, threw a couple hundred thousand our way. They all pulled out money every year uh, to finance this film. And we had a budget. I had a line, line items this long, you know, of what we need to do to get this done. And every year they kept, they were serious. And I was like, Wow, we 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 have to move forward because they want to do this. So to get to the point to where it actually gets distribution is huge for a group like this. Mm. This happens to organizations that do movies all the time and that just drop it off and go, "Yep, okay, up on iTunes and other platforms." It doesn't happen to us, and it did. So for it to be able to sit there and and be ready for again, Masters of the Air. I mean, if uh, you know, Spielberg, Hanks, they want to put that out. I know they have been touring some of the airfields out there the last couple of years um, and doing their research. Most of it uh, can probably, you know, be shot on a soundstage if they want, but I'm sure they're going to go back to some location out there and replicate what they need. Uh, I believe some of that story is the 100th bomb group. So parts of that base is there. But 
you know how Hollywood is. They'll 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 do it uh, as you know as best they can, but they also have to watch their their budget. Uh, but to to have our film sit on a platform and be ready for people to watch as another reference, I think is just awesome. Yeah, yeah. well, I I agree, and um, I, I I can only thank you very much for being part of this. And and we at War History Online will do our absolute utmost to push it because I I think it's it's really good. Uh, I, I, yeah. I was asked to do this and. And I enjoyed it. I say three times I've watched it, and um, wow. yeah. So the Eighth Air Force has been part of you know, my life growing up in East Anglia, and Amazing. anything that gets across that connection between the locals and the, and the, the servicemen is it gets my vote every day. So thank you very That's much. Great. And, uh, we yeah. will post links up, and this could be part of a, of a of three days of promotion. We'll do a War History Online about the film, and we'll try and get out some information to a wider audience about what you're doing and the passion behind it. And I wish you every, every success with it and anything I can do to help in my small corner of the world here in Normandy, just, just ask. And thank you very much, both of you uh, for being part of this. And um, what can I say? Good luck with the film. And I look yeah. forward to our next project and the Peresti raid and anything else you work on, because you've, yeah. you've got a winning combination partnership there. So brilliant. Yeah. Thank you very Great. much. Thank you very much. Awesome. Enjoyed it. Thank you. Appreciate your time.